So Steve Sorensen, he's the Northland Geospatial Information Specialist Analyst. So he's going to talk to you about what to do with all this data. So Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Unmute myself. Can y'all hear me? We got you loud and clear. Good. Good. All right. This guy up here. As uh, Tom said, I'm the uh, geospatial intelligence analysis instructor at Northland College. And this afternoon, we're going to have fun. So especially with everybody having that carb rush and getting all tired and sleepy here. And I'm just going to lull you right into just I mean, uh, get you all excited. So uh, we're going to talk about UAS imagery and GIS this afternoon. And with that, let's get started. So we're going to cover availability of UAS imagery. Then we're going to go into some uh, developing sample data sets, creating mosaics and stitching, open source software, and some use of ArcGIS online for analysis. Um, hopefully you are all able to download Google Earth Pro if you don't have it already um, and log into Arc ArcGIS online and to esri.com. If you haven't, you just get to watch me go through it. So no worries. Okay, so availability of imagery. If you don't have your own drone, there are several places you can get imagery to utilize and process. Um, most of it I look at is free imagery. So it uh, shouldn't cost you anything, which is really helpful. But um, a lot of the states, their, either their IT or their Department of Natural Resources will have um, imagery sources. In Minnesota, the uh, Minnesota State uh, IT Services has what they call MinGeo. It's a state repository for uh, geospatial and geographic information. And the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has a site called Mintopo that does the same thing. I'm sure other states also have similar services. So if you were to log into the MinGeo site, this is what you'd be greeted with. So you can see the the options they have, several offerings and information on finding GIS data. If you log into the Mentopo site, theirs is a little different. It brings you right into a map. So you can talk about, look at GPS information, download data, You can do elevations. So on this one here, you see, going back to the first one, you see just a regular map. Steve, could I have you share your screen? Sure, thought it was. Thank you. So let's go back one here. Okay, so to this screen here, you're seeing the, the GPS location, just a regular map. Steve, we're not seeing it yet. Oh, great. I don't know why that wouldn't be. How is this then? There you go. Now we're good. Now we're good? We see your um, desktop. Yep. Okay. All right. That's perfect. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So all that stuff I said before, the availability of different agencies you can get the information from. That's what the MIN uh, geo site looks like. And that, that's a repository for the state. So all the stuff you see, uh, or I should say most of the stuff you see on MIN Topo would be in MIN geo, um, plus other data that's been collected by other uh, state agencies. 
And then I'm in Topo, like I was saying, you got the your regular map, GPS location. You can download data to it. This one shows elevations. So not only do we have the map, now we have contour elevations to it. You can pull in layers. This layer here is actually showing flooding along the river. So that's where the flooding comes up, right up next to the runway, which is always good. And then you can also add a base map to it. So now we've got a regular imagery map, base map underneath with our contours and a layer. So that, that layering effect of uh, adding more information via the layers is what really makes um, GIS stand out and help with analysis. So the US Geological Survey or USGS is a wonderful site. They have tons of maps and information. So you can get pretty much maps on anything you want. Water maps, land maps, and the plus side to USGS is that the larger government entities like NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, they deal in both classified and unclassified data but their unclassified data, they send off to USGS to make it available to the public. And when they declassify classified information, that then gets also gets sent over to USGS. So the benefits of government information. So that, that works through there. They're basically the portal for all the, the data or a lot of the data. But there are also other entities out there. As you can see, you see me on their, their site. They have different, different locations you can go gather that information, get energy, geology information, data and tools, GIS data, map topics, maps. Another agency you can get stuff from is NASA. NASA does have a lot of information you can pull down and uh, utilize in your classes. It can become very helpful. We also have, let's see, they have one. Let's see, right here. Okay. I do believe they also have a, an educational site on their website. So they, they provide data and information to educational institutions. And then our nice sleeper hidden one. Anyone guess what it is? Do you remember the slide? It's NOAA. Really? No, not that NOAA. This NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So they, they have also a lot of information, but you can get weather information. Um, as you can see on the side, marine and aviation information. They also have an education section. And got the links in here to all those sites if you didn't have them. So you can access those as you need to or would want to. But also I'd encourage you if you're not like you're not from Minnesota, look up your state's uh, sites and see if they have um, geo sites for you to access. Any questions so far? Okay. No questions, we'll just keep driving on. So developing sample, sample data sets. Um, developing sample data sets is basically an exercise in data management. So how are you going to store your data so you can access it later on and utilize it? Data can take up a huge amount of space. So if you can access offsite uh, storage for it, it's wonderful or save it in small bites. 
But again, the example you see on the screen here, I didn't create that. I borrowed that from uh, from Esri, I believe it was. That's that's one of their formats of of um, managing data. So as you can see there, there's uh, four folders, an admin folder. So in, in that you would put your reports or Word documents related to your project. Base maps, you would put any base maps you have, or you could store geodatabases in that one. Data sets is your, your raw data and your working products. And then shape files would be any uh, standalone shape files related to your project. So that's one way of organizing things. And this becomes important here when you start using, um, start using ArcGIS, especially Arc Pro. That can be very helpful to have things organized in that manner. So what you'll see inside the folders like this is that example here is our uh, Bowser grant project. It's uh, Board of Water and Soil Reclamation. And you've got the four there. You've got an additional one that's a working folder and then two outside documents. But if you clicked on the data sets file, this is what you'd see. These are all the ditches or the majority of the ditches that we we were flying in that project. So if you were to click on one of the ditches, in this case, ditch 21, we have that organized by the date that we flew it. So the reason we're doing that is you've got, each ditch has its own folder, so we know where that ditch is and which ditch we're talking about. Then when you click in the folder, a ditch may have multiple flight days. So we organize the files and the data for that flight day under the date that it was flown to make it easier to find. And then clicking into that, you get the actual data that's inside. In this case, it's the LIDAR data. So that gives you your LIDAR data. Now in images, and I'm probably telling most of you stuff you already know here, but for a georeferenced image, you need at least two things, the image, obviously, and then the metadata, which is the Geo, geospatial data that tells you where the image belongs on the face of the earth. And that's usually found that you see here the TIFF, that's the image, the TFW, that's the metadata. So you need those two files. And then let's see, yeah, up on the side here, you see going to the date, we had the two LIDAR and PIX4D. PIX4D is a stitching software. So this the imagery in the PIX4D would be the um, regular uh, photo imagery, what we call the RGB imagery, and then that the stitch product in there. So you click on that, we've got the raw images here and then the product, and there's the PIX product files. So when it processes through PIX, then we'll get this response back, all this data here. So as you can see, a lot of data. Our DNR project that we were working with the DNR, taking uh, imagery of forestry plots, organized it the same way. And find the data sets, go into the actual, whichever plot was flown. And then we'd have our data. And here it's, uh, the other one was TIFFs. These are shape files. So the same thing, they'll import in. Any questions on that? Okay, no questions. Moving forward. Creating mosaics and stitching. So what what the software does when it uh, when it stitches the images together, it's ba basically making a collage, a mosaic of all the individual images. So in in 
most flights that we do, we average around 100 to a couple a couple hundred, almost a 1,000 images, depending on the size of the, the ditch or field we're flying. So the example you're seeing here is PIX4D. So you would open up a new project, import the images, and then it'll, it'll stitch it together or show you the the field, each of these dots here is an individual image. So it'll, it geo-references that picture to, to the earth. And then when it stitches it together, it matches, what the stitching does is it matches the imagery, the pixel images, and also matches the geo-reference to it. So what you end up with, excuse me, what you end up with then is the mosaic here. And in reference to what's around it, if you zoom out, then you can see, see what's on there. This one here is what we're doing. I'm looking at the large image, but I have all the participants hanging over my screen, so I can't see it. But this one looks like a DSM here of the same area. So you can get both out of this, out of the processing in PIX. So. Okay. So like I was saying, takes a couple hundred pictures, stitches them together into the geo-referenced image. So you get your image and then you can see how that applies or affects into the surrounding area. So when you're doing your, your analysis of whatever your project or, or item is, you can give it that reference, that spatial reference into how it affects what's going on. Any questions on stitching? Okay. So I use PIX4D as an example of stitching software. There are many different softwares out there. You don't have to use PIX4D. It's not exactly inexpensive. That's, that's why I'm saying you don't have to use it. It is good software. But there are other softwares out there that you can use that are free or less expensive. Steve, I was just, did you want to touch on a little bit about how a lot of high schools and other organizations may have ArcGIS and be able to stitch it in ArcGIS Pro now? Say that again, Tom. Um, a lot of schools may have access to Esri products, ArcGIS, and using they should be able to implement. And, and we will talk a little bit about that in your lesson plans tomorrow as far as utilizing ArcGIS Pro for stitching and for generating some of these products, which may be free or very little cost under some of these agreements that Esri might have with these states. Yes, I was going to touch on that a little yesterday or tomorrow, but we can touch on some of that today too. Esri does have some stitching uh, functionality. In fact, they have uh, drone to map, which uh, literally takes the images from the drone, processes it through actually PIX4D and produces your image for you. So it, it's kind of like a I don't want to say a one-stop shop, but it shortens the whole processing thing. It, it automates a lot of that for you. So it can process it out. There's other things you can do in ArcGIS, um, especially in like Pro, ArcGIS Pro, where you can uh, go into scene, either global or local, and uh, do more um, analysis and manipulation of the imagery. So it's, I like to start simple with Google Earth Pro, but 
comparing Google Earth Pro to ArcGIS is like ArcGIS is on steroids. It's there's a lot, lot more you can do with ArcGIS than you can with uh, Google Earth. But, and I would encourage you if your state does have um, a, a license, like a state license, um, educational license for ArcGIS for S3, I would strongly encourage you to to get uh, hooked up with that. It can make a big difference. Minnesota does. The Department of Education has a educational license with S3, so that makes a lot of uh, S3 software and uh, applications available to us. So I would, would highly encourage you to, to seek out your, your state's Department of Education or whoever uh, runs that for your state and get that set up. If they don't have it set up, if they do access it. Because as we'll see a little later on here, that, that can work to your advantage greatly. References. So here's some, some links to online software for stitching. Um, I'm not going to go into each of them because I think that would take too long here given the time we have. But you can visit those sites, see what they have. Some of them have um, the words escaping me. Um, basically free trial um, licenses where you can just do a free trial of it, see how it works, and then you can either commit or not commit. So it's worth checking out to see what works best for you for your um, your purposes in your classes. And now the fun part, ArcGIS Online for Analysis. So we've got all these images. We've got a project or something to work on for the class. What do we do? Well, let us exit out of here. And go into Arc Online. So as we go into ARC Online, you'll notice at the header here, you've got several options or many options. So we're looking at the groups. One of the things you can do is you can set up your classes or your projects as groups and store your information there. So what the advantage of doing ARC Online here is that ARC has programs where if you share the information or make the, your information, your product available to the public, they will not charge you for storage. If you keep that, that information or that documentation private, then they will charge you for storage. So you not only can get a lot of storage space for free through ESRI, in ARC Online, but you can also have access to a lot of free data. So that's one way. And as you all got the invites, if I clicked on organization, it shows our organization, which is us. If I clicked on members, it'll show all of you listed in there and some others. But as you can see, you can go to map to bring up a map and you can work your project here and save it. Set up a base map, add data. And when I was talking about the file structure, when you're adding a layer from a file, you can choose a file. You can choose the LiDAR data set. I'm going to go to, just click on DNR. And it's not going to let me do that, is it? No. OK, we'll do it the hard way. And 
Yep, didn't like it. Let's go back. Report back. Okay. Good learning example. In ARC Online, it wants it in a zip, a CSV, or GPS exchange format, or a GeoJSON file. So what I had in my data set was not any of those, so it wouldn't import it. So you have to remember to, when you're looking at importing data, it has to be in the proper file format. So you may have to change file formats as you're importing data. So, sorry, I thought I had one on there. But like in base map, you can change your base map to whatever you want. The imagery brings up the imagery. So, I'll go back. Gallery. Okay, so this is what I was talking about, storing and sharing. When you create documents on, uh, on ARC Online, it'll save them in your gallery. So now you've got all these different maps in here. I've got a bunch of them. So you can create maps, different layers on those maps. Let me open one up. Seeing the one on. I'll just bring one up. So, so as you bring a layer in, it's got the layer there, geo referenced. You give it transparency. I didn't move it. So by creating these, then you can create create different data and information images with each layer telling it its own story. And the advantage of Arc Online is that you have story maps. Which is essentially a interactive PowerPoint, which can help you identify. In this case, we were looking at tribal boundaries from the 1851 uh, treaty. So you have the treaty on the left here, and you have maps with identifying information here. So this point here, this flag, click on it, it gives you more information. So that's where Fort Laramie was. It was supposed to be the site of the treaty. And over here, that's where the, the treaty was actually signed. They moved the treaty site to over here. But as you can see, by clicking on those, it brings up more information. And quite literally, in a story map, you could have a story map within a story map within a story map. So I could click on this, and it could bring me to a new story map. And then I could click on something in that story map, and it would bring me to another story map. So by doing that, you could create a whole class, say you're teaching history, you could have a whole history class on one story map. It just goes from different section to section as you weed through it. This, uh, they have multiple setups. This setup, we have the tabs across the top and it moves from topic to topic. So here, the Assiniboine, this is the reservation territory, the boundaries of the Assiniboine territory as described from the treaty. Now what we did with that, how we got that was we read the treaty and just followed the directions. It's like connect the dots. So the territory of the Assiniboine commencing at the mouth of the Yellowstone. So you go find the mouth of the Yellowstone and thence up the Missouri to the mouth of the, of the Muscle Shell 
and then you go up the Missouri to the mouth of the Muscle Shell. And you just start making those points. And by the time you connect all the dots or make the dots, then connect the dots, now you have the boundary. So that's one use of GIS in and story maps in um, lesson plans and education. That's one way of using it. Um, what else we got here? Let's switch over to If you all want to look on, let's see. Let's go to this first before we start into that. Seem to have lost my screen here. Okay. That's not working. What screen are you seeing right now? We're seeing the COVID-19 support. Okay. That's what we need. Okay. So on SRE.com, if you log into that, which you should all have access to. Click on. Go into mapping. You can see on mapping. You go into story maps. And I'll tell you all about story maps, how to set them up. The important part on ESRI is on my ESRI. Since we set you all up and after this after this uh, workshop we'll keep you on for a little bit on ARC Online but then we'll we'll be dropping you from ARC Online but your access to my to ESRI.com will not end. Even though we take you off ARC Online you'll still be up on uh, ESRI.com. And the important part of that is in esri.com they have um, they have webinars, workshops, and um, and actually lesson plans that you can access. Training. So go up to your name, hit training. And you go into catalog, course catalog, it lists what they have. You can search them by schedule, by location. So if you click on catalog, 
can search for courses. See down here our courses. Have new one, like this one's a new one. It's free. Scroll down and look for them, or you can search them here. Say you want to do something on story maps. And it'll bring up story map. So some are free, some are not free. But this gives you access to all the, all those webinars, tutorials, learning plans. You can access all that for your uh, for your classes. So, any questions at this point? Nothing in the chat yet, sir. Nothing in, huh? Okay. Well, if we go to want to bring up Bring up Google Earth Pro. Let's see, a plenty of spots. I got the Earth on here. And I should be in. In your classes, there should be yes. Okay. So if you go to your content in D2L under the UAS and image UAS imagery and GIS, there are sample data sets, which would be KMZ files for the tribal areas. If you want to download those and load them up into Google Earth Pro, then we can identify those on there. A little practical exercise for you. So, so that's that's what I have for you now. If there are, unless there are any other questions. Yes, yeah, Steve. So I've got uh, we've got one. Uh, do, does Esri have a page that lets us know if our state has purchased a license? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if they do or not. I think that might be, uh, you might have to email them their customer service. So I would go to their site, uh, send any inquiry to their customer service to see if your state does have a license. Uh, this is Michael Hernandez in Weaver State. Yeah, I, never, I run that for my school. Uh, your state should have, or at least even your, your institution may have a rep. So if you have an Esri product, and you would know who to call if you don't. I think what Steve said is the way to go. Just contact somebody in the education area for your region and they can point you in the right direction.
And Steve, uh, could you walk through again uh, on the D2L site from when you open the course, how to get to your sample data? Sure. Okay. So when you open the course, so when you open the course, you go up to materials, and you click on content, and scroll down to UAS imagery and GIS. You click on that and it'll drop down the inside files. But if you just click on that, it brings you to this page. And it'll be in the develop sample data sets. You click on the, the down arrow on that and all the KMZs, the data is in there. Now, depending on how, how your computer is set up, when you download that, it might save it as something other than a KMZ. So then you would have to go into the, the downloads on your screen, which would be go into your PC and then click on downloads and it would show your downloads. Um, and find those downloads to see what it, downloaded it as and then you can save it as a KMZ. You should be able to convert it there. Hey, Steve, this is Tom. Um, I just want to mention to everyone, I posted a link in the chat <laughs> for, um, it's an ArcGIS map that shows, um, it's from Esri, it shows if your school has, currently has an agreement with Esri. Um, it is K through 12 um, for the licensing, and it is free. There are educational packs for, and it gives all the information in the two links that I sent. Or that is K through 12. Okay, and that's on sg.com? I sent the link in the chat, so everyone okay. will have the link. And we'll, we'll, we'll post it in the, we'll post it in this um, presentation on D12 as well. All right, it looks like the, we do have a question from uh, Julie. She's wanting to know if there's any suggestions for good tutorials on using ARC GIS story maps. Here, let me take a look. There should be, I think I have that map, that up here. And Steve, she also says specifically other than the ESRI tutorials and materials uh, a little later on down. Oh, that, I don't know. I've only used the ESRI ones, but, uh, well, I take that back. There we Geotech, and let me go to that site for you here. Share the screen right now. Which one do you want? This one. Um, Why is it never on here? There we go, thank you. Yes, the National Center of Ge yeah. There you go. No, not what I wanted. Always hides on me. Geotech. National Geospatial Technology Center of Excellence. This is another site, good site for geospatial information, and they do have model courses. And I think find it here.
pretty sure they do. I don't know exactly where on here to find it. I'm sorry, but they do have one. And if we can't find one, I can certainly, I know the, uh, the instructor who has done modules for geotech. So I can get, get those from her or get you in touch with her. And Steve, we got somebody who's wondering uh, if they have access to ArcGIS Online, Google Earth Pro, and Esri.com access, is there anything they're going to need for tomorrow's session? All those. Access to Arc Online, access to um, Google Earth Pro, and then have those, um, those KMZs downloaded off of D2L. Yep, that's it. All right, well, I wanna I once again, thank everybody for coming today. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, tomorrow we're definitely gonna get busy on the, where the rubber meets the road on lesson planning and how to get this stuff into your program specifically. If there are no other questions, we'll kind of hang around for a while if anybody wants to have chat time or whatever. If not, you're welcome to leave and we will see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock.